Steele. This is John Drake. You are on Breaths with Friends. Now, John Drake Good is day. a... Nice to meet you. Nice Everybody. to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, John Drake, I'm going to fill, fill in the blanks what I'm missing, but you're a cinematographer. Okay. You worked in Hollywood or you worked in the industry for like a long time. You're uh, a painter as well. And is there anything else I'm missing? Yes. Uh, a writer, an author. Oh, that's right. Books. Yes, yes. A poet. And uh, a traveler. A procrastinator, as you well know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so let's start from the beginning. Okay. When you're a small child growing up in England. <laughs> What's okay. um? Can you tell? Okay, so you grew up in England, or where'd you grow up? Tell us. Give us a. Give us. We'll talk about five minutes or ten minutes about your past, and then you know all the stuff that you're willing to talk about, and then we'll talk, go from there. Can't talk about my past. Okay. No, no, I'm just joking. Um, all right. Well, I was born in London, near Camden Town, which is a uh, quite the hot spot now. It was a bit rough when I uh, used to live there, um, and then from the age of eleven, my my folks moved to the country just outside of London in a place called Epsom, which is where Epsom Sorts comes from and, uh, and the Derby, the Epsom Derby. So it was kind of um, sort of suburbia, but on the edge of the countryside and, and the country around there was all horse country. So there were a lot of uh, horse farms and stables, you know, racing, racehorses. And... Um, so I lived uh, there till, well, I finally left England, not, not till I was about 23, but uh, I ended up moving to Brighton on the south coast of uh, England and set up a little uh, photo studio on the end of the pier, which was a lot of fun. Didn't get a lot of customers because the rain was always blowing from the one side of the pier and then people would walk around one side and the wind would be blowing and, uh, and then they would just walk back the other side. So I had to have a megaphone and I had a red and white striped blazer, you know, like the Victorians and a boater hat. And I would use my megaphone and uh, get people to come in and have their picture taken. So it was kind of just a fun job. It was kind of a crazy job, but it was a lot of fun. It was on the pier. And that was where Brighton in the, in the old days, in the early sixties was where all the mods and rockers used to go and have their fights, you know, yeah. do, you, do you know the mods and rockers? I've heard about, I heard about those things. Uh, did you ever get uh, any photojournalistic uh, sort of stuff going with the fights? Did you ever shoot those? I was a little um, too young when, when all that was going on, really. I was probably only about 14 when uh, when that was all going on which was uh, like 60s early 60s um so i didn't know but um brian's a great place it's um trying to compare it to uh, somewhere in america um you know it's kind of an art artist community there's an art school there and it's on the coast you know it's on the english channel so uh 20 miles away is France, and uh, on a good day, you could see France. But um, yeah, it was a nice, nice town, good good people there. Uh, it was a lot of fun living there. <laughs> I'm a little right. bit drunk. Oh, good. <laughs> You're good. That's perfect. I encourage our audience to drink and smoke weed as, as well. Yes, I, I recommend it. It's better it. if you do it that way. I highly recommend it. Yeah. 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 If, if, if anybody out there hasn't caught on, it's mm -hmm. better if you do this. If you watch the past episodes, yeah. Oh, yeah, I I that's why, yeah, that's why I'm getting into training. Oh, now. Yeah. Well, you've yeah. been training yeah. for that for like a long time. <laughs> I have, it's true. <laughs> uh, when you're um, when you were in high school and stuff like that, were you uh, creative as well? Which because uh, I want to backtrack a little bit because you went and did these photographs on the pier. Where, where did that did yeah. that did that build up from beginning from something? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I always enjoyed photography. You know, I bought a little 35 mil camera mm -hmm. when I was 13 or 14, I suppose. And uh, when I left school, I didn't have a clue what to do, really. I took, uh, in those days, we used to take GCE exams, which was General Certificate of Education when you were 16 or so. And if you pass, 
passed, uh, I think that's passed four or five before you went on to A-level exams. So you stayed at school another two years, which then that got you into college or university. But I left after I took my GCE exams. So I was 17 and uh, I left school and didn't know what to do. And my, you know, hobby was photography. So I ended up getting a job in a... Uh, in the sort of research laboratory, in a, in a, uh, there was a company called Pavel, and they used to make um, printing paper, color printing paper. And they were trying to uh, compete with Kodak, which, you know, they, they couldn't. But anyway, so my first job was in a dark room. <laughs> Sounds weird. But um, so that's where <laughs> a lot I, of people's first job was in a dark room. So that's where I, I got my photographic. Uh, skills it was very technical what i used to do it was called sensitometry and you would plot the characteristic curves of a film and all the rest of this and so i did that for about a year and then i i had a motorcycle and i i went off with a friend around uh, france and spain and portugal for the summer because you know growing up in england you had europe at your doorstep all you had to do was cross the channel you know and you could go to one of, you know, God knows how many countries. What time so, of year was this? When, uh, what's the best time to be in Europe, weather-wise? In, in the summer. And what's I mean, the summertime? Is it our summer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so any time from, you know, if you go to Greece, it's nice there in May. It's not, the ocean's a bit cold, the Mediterranean that time of year. But yeah, May through September, October, like on the Greek islands from October on, the winds really blow and howl and it gets cold, but not, not unbearably so, you know. So that's that's what a lot of us used to do. And it was that was the age, you know, as well. It was the age of when the, the magic bus went off to Kathmandu and all this, and that was the, the hippie thing, you know, and that was late 60s. Um, what would the uh, what would that what can you because uh, that sounds interesting. What's the deal with the uh, the bus with the hippies? What were they doing and where were they going and what were they? Was it a comedy yeah. situation? Were they partying or what? Yeah. yeah, well, it was it was um, it was called the Magic Bus. You know the Who song, the Magic Bus. <clears throat> I don't know whether it was based on that, but I think probably was. <laughs> so it was just a bus, you know, that was spray painted and it went from London or Amsterdam, one of the two all the way to uh, Kathmandu. So they went all the way through Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, over the Khyber Pass, down into uh, India, and eventually Kathmandu, which is where, you know, and that's where all the hippies went and so on. But, um, and it was, you know, it was never that safe, but certainly you couldn't do that trip now, obviously, through those countries. And a lot of people that I met that were in Afghanistan, they, uh, you know, they love the place. They love the Afghani people. And uh, in those days, women were wearing blue jeans too, the Afghani women. And now the whole thing's gone back to the dark ages. That's crazy. When did that happen? Because I, I remember seeing some like retro pictures of like Afghanistan, uh, Afghan women and or fashion from Iran. And uh, before, were they, they weren't always doing the burkas. They were, they were actually getting, it was really kind of Americanized. They were yeah, no, yeah, they were. Before the, what happened with that? Do you know? Well, it was, uh, there was the, um, the, uh, the revolution there, wasn't it? The Khomeini came in and that was, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know. And then it all turned into radical Islamic um, culture. And they, uh, I don't know. I don't, you know. Yeah. I was picking your brain. I was spitballing. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. And it doesn't make sense to me anywhere in the world because we seem to be going backwards instead of forwards. And Have you been checking out the, uh, the Israel? Well, I don't want to get political, but uh, since we're on Israel and Palestine, have you checked out that stuff? What's happening right now? I mean. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, crazy. I, I don't know. I just lost a friend on Facebook because of it. Actually, he just uh, blocked me because so many people can't take a debate when it comes to those issues you know the fact is that the palestinian people live in horrendous conditions they have water for half the day their electricity is cut off they live in a in an area that's 25 miles by five and uh you know i'm gonna oh God, maybe i'll get loads of comments now but you know they are basically oppressed i think but God forbid if you should say things like that. I mean, I'm neither pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. I, you know, it's it's just unfortunate that this has had to happen. But you can blame the British for that, I guess, because we put the Jews 
1948. Wait, can you repeat and, that? Um, because you, can you repeat that last sentence? Because you're Palestinian not... people, definitely. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last sentence? Just because you kind of yeah, locked well, up there for a second. Yeah, you did. Bent, um, yeah, the um, well, the in 1948. You know, after after the war, it was the British that um, took the end of the the Jewish people to to Israel, which was then called Palestine. It was called Palestine. But um, pretty hardcore shit. So that probably wasn't a very good. That wasn't probably a very good idea, really. So uh, you tell me. I don't want to get into politics because I. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's just a friend. Trust me, this will go. This will. This will. This will. This conversation will go through many little waves. Look at that. That looks kind of cool. Yeah. Well, it, you know, people, people get so crazy over over this stuff. Um, but, you know, I just left a, a, a comment saying, well, it wasn't the Palestinians that had the uh, concentration camps, was it? You know, and I, 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 I find that. You know, it always goes back to the Holocaust, and you know, which was a terrible, dreadful thing to happen, of course. But keep dragging that up, and now they seem to be using it. You know, the Israelis when I don't know. It's a whole clock. We'll, get, we'll it's jump. Right. Hey, we'll jump out of this conversation just as fast as we jumped in it. We can yeah. just jump in, jump in, jump. Yeah, well, exactly. But the, the whole politics thing these days. I mean, it's. I don't know if there's freedom of speech anymore. It doesn't seem like it. And hypocrisy seems to rule the waves right now. You know, and when you look at the American government and what's going on, and Trump is still, you know. No, ah, we don't use that name around here. No, no, no. <laughs> A small T. I mean, he still seems like he's still around. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, he's not around. He's not around. Crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be able but... to bleep his name for this podcast with it. Yeah, no, we Every time we say that. I'm sorry. About that. We, no, I'm no. Sorry. I just, I, I now just, yeah, I want to yeah. make that a reoccurring segment. So whenever, because oh. I've had a dump a couple. I knew is, it's all good. Let's get back to the art. We can so when, that, when yeah. you, uh, when you uh, were growing up and you're doing cinematography or photography, uh, what kind of camera were you using? And did you ever use a three quarter inch negative camera? Um, yeah, I started on a on a with a plate camera, uh, four by five. It was four by five, so the negative was four inches by five inch plate camera. So I worked in Harrods when I was um, 20 and uh, was a photographer there. There was a place called The Way In and it was like uh, for the younger set. It was on the top floor, you know, and it was when everyone wore Paisley and, uh, and flared nice. pants. And, you know, it was the Kings Road, Carnaby Street era. And so I worked in this place. It was just a franchise, but we used to do these 30 by 40 size portraits of people with the, the, the plate camera. Wow. So they, would, they would come in and we had two electronic flashes like bang. And um, there was a machine called, uh, it was from Kodak that we used to rent and it was called an activator stabilizer machine. So what we would do, we would take the photograph with a four by five plate camera, take the slide out and go into the dark room, develop it really fast in high concentrated developer for a couple of minutes, throw it in the fixed, really high concentrated fix and then the wash and while it was still wet throw it in the, the enlarger throw the enlarger to the top of the stand project it on the floor onto 30 by 40 paper and then we'd feed it through this um well it was a printer it was early printer so you'd feed it through and it would um it would develop the image the paper and would come out in five minutes or less than five minutes all dry and everything but you had to get it fixed because it didn't get fixed uh, so people had to come back and then we'd send it off to get fixed but the whole process took about not even 10 minutes what do you mean fixed are you saying uh, a fixative uh, uh chemical to so that the yeah. image won't disappear yeah yeah exactly yeah so I we would ask myself right there <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> uh, um boy that would be fun to have a setup like that right now it would except everybody's got cell phones right but i don't know it's like people buying vinyl i suppose you know i mean i know there is a a whole lot of younger people now want to want to do that they want to shoot with film and uh i mean there's nothing more fun than taking a picture with negative developing the neg and having the dark room i mean you've done all that right i never did uh in high school i did black and white and yeah. I, I i took uh, two photography classes 
and I used, uh, yeah, I used my lunchtime to develop uh, stuff. It was super fun. I mean, it's a real, like, t I'm not good with, like, time and stuff like that. So, using the timers to, but I did, like, the, uh, I spent a lot of time in the dark room. It was really, God, that, I'm going to cry. It was so nice over there back in the day. <laughs> so, so nice just to, uh, yeah, no, just, to just taking pictures. And I use a lot of those pictures, too. I mean, I still have a lot of those. But, um the yeah. develop and pay, and color is a whole developing color is a whole fucking other bot that's a monster isn't that a completely different oh yeah monster? yeah yeah it's a lot a lot more involved principles are the same but um you work with three primary colors red green and blue blue or brew that you put under the lens on the, yeah on under you put the, the filters in front of the uh, lens mm -hmm. and so you you dial in or dial out the colors until you get the until you get the colors the correct you do a test with a yeah, strip you got to do loads of tests yeah 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 uh, yeah yeah color do you have anyway, any so all that was fun. do you have any of those prints What's that? do you have any images of those prints? <laughs> the color ones yeah um, well, well if you want you know what we'll put them on the video we'll edit them in if you send them to okay. me, let me just take a picture yeah, of the I'm camera. I'm not sure I have any. I've got plenty of black and white stuff. Black though. and white's fine. Yeah, we'll, I'm we'll not put sure. Put those in there. Yeah, do you, do you like black and white as much as color, or color more than black and white? Well, I, I used to take, uh, you know, when I was traveling, I would always take the Kodachrome slides, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, sorry, we're being. If you want to say something, you gotta get in the camera. All right. Uh, here, well, you threw it to me. I had to get up to get it. You have to. We have a fan here who might make a special appearance. He's give us uh, this is uh, do you remember this guy? I do remember this guy. How are you? Not too bad. You're on the show, Flood. Oh, good. Oh, shit. Hey, hey, it's a big time. Hey, it's a big time. I read this one. You, you had quite a fucked up childhood, I gotta say. <laughs> no, I had a fucked up life. My childhood was great. I'm halfway through. <laughs> I'm halfway through. I don't know how it ends up, but. Oh, well, it, it, this is where it ends up. <laughs> this is where you're seeing where it ends up. Not bad, not bad. It's not a pretty sight, but that's what you get. And there's the other guy. He's promoting me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was great. Come on. There look is. at that hair. You got good hair, man. Yeah, still, I yeah, wish I had good hair still like look that. look the same. I've never had good hair like that. Yeah. I go to the hairdressers every day. Do it. Look at that! So, it's like a, it's like a beaut. I want to yeah, put my fingers on. I actually, I don't want to pat your head, but I want to touch your hair. You got the rod stool. <laughs> that painting's wet. I like the painting, by the way. That's the new stuff. Yeah, like so it. He's, you're midway through the book, and you like it so yeah. far. Oh okay. yeah. Great. And the other one, the New York stories are uh, the Big Apple stories are pretty good too. <laughs> oh, you started that too? Oh, good. Cool. I know I'm a bit of ADD on the reading. I get into both and just oh. get don't get both. don't get confused between the no, two. No, no, they're definitely different, different, <laughs> different deal for sure. I should put these here at least. Well, here, well, he's got them on him. He'll plug them. We'll right, be talking we'll about plug, his books we'll in a second. Him. Okay, get thanks, to it, guys. Claude Duhamel, yeah. uh, sir, actor. Hire him for your next bar mitzvah. Oh, yeah. I uh, I moved here in '97, and I know I had a friend who was an abstract painter, English guy, and he came here and he used to paint out out the back um of my place when i had a lot more room here and so he got me you know he would he, he would paint acrylic and he would paint like this and then he would spray it and then it would all run and then he'd look back and he'd say what color do you think i should use here now and i said oh, i don't know that maybe and then uh <clears throat> he would sell his stuff with that was six by four that kind of size for 10, 20,000 pounds because he was attached to a good gallery in London on Bond Street. And, you know, this stuff was all right. Um, um, so anyway, I would run into the <laughs> art store. <laughs> I would run into the art store to get his stuff and I said why don't you set, set me up with some paints and things so I got some acrylics and started painting and uh, I just loved a bit then I didn't like the feel of acrylic it was too plasticky I liked the feel of oils and working it you know so anyway that's that's how it all started because I thought well god if he can do this and he's getting 20,000 not that I ever sell stuff but you know what it's like it's uh so you did it for the money 
he did it for the money. I didn't do it for the money. No. I the money was it. at first as like a ring a bell off in your head, right? Yeah, no, I wouldn't mind doing it for the money now. I mean, I've got almost a thousand paintings. It's crazy. Well, I don't know. You can probably see in the background there, right? Yeah, I like yeah. the background. I like this yeah. background you got. You chose there. <laughs> I like it. I'm surrounded all the way. It's all the way around, and I just put some in storage at a friend's place. But yeah, I, I probably have a thousand now. So we're gonna have to have another show at some point. Yeah, I can sell in bulk, you know. <laughs> Well, um, so, okay, we, we skipped a large part of your career uh, from jumping from the, the photography uh, yes. okay. so, and Kathmandu and, and then going to the painting. Um, so you had an illustrious film career as a cinematographer. And can you tell well, me how you got, got that the glasses and what you, for your first How oh, I got into it. Um, I literally fell into it like a lot of people do. Um, I was, um, well, going back a bit. So after I had the place in Brighton, I left, uh, and, um, a friend of mine was going off to India and he said, do I, did I want to go? So I went off to India. I spent almost a year in India, lived in Goa in a little house for $2 a week, rent right on the Arabian Sea. Then I came back to England. I couldn't relate to England after being in India. Then I met a friend of mine. He said, do I want to go to South America? So I said, yeah, sounds good. So we got a banana boat. We went and sat in a pub on the Thames. And, uh, you know, we were talking about how we're going to get. So we wanted to go to Caracas and then go all the way through South America. How old were you exactly at this point? Uh, 24. Ah, you're right in the... Yeah. yeah. That sounds, we're getting, <laughs> it's a... It's a very much a movie, this kind of, this uh, story. It is. Let's do it. Don't you know anyone with money? So uh, I know people with money, but they don't spend it on good, cool shit. Uh, they don't spend it. They yeah. Spend it. <laughs> they do. They're not spending it with me. Not in the right places. Oh, so this would be a perfect end of time. All these paintings are for sale behind Mr. Drake and myself. These are all for sale. So That's right. That's right. Okay, now let's and now yeah, let's get to anyway. So, um, so anyway, so we uh, we go, we had a few drinks, and uh, my last name's Drake, right? So, Drake was the uh, adventurer, pirate, beat the Spanish Armada in 1588, and all that. So, I've always feel felt like this, uh, maybe as an ancestor or something, be nice. So, I know I'm looking for his gold somewhere, yeah. but anyway, so, um I called Fives Bananas because I knew there were banana boats, literally banana boats. They're called banana boats and they go from England to Jamaica and they bring bananas back and all different companies go to different islands, you know, different makes of bananas, breeds of bananas, whatever you want to call them. They go to How different... many different breeds of bananas are there? Uh, well, there are different names on them. Well, I think there are quite a few, I think. There's certainly quite a few in LA. There's a lot in LA. Um, <clears throat> but um, anyway, so we take a freighter, we take a freighter across the Atlantic, it's 12 days and we left in the hurricane season and it was like this, it was, it was wild and we ended up in, living in Jamaica and then uh, we, we spent all our money on banana daiquiris and jumping off the ricks at rocks, jumping off the ricks at rocks cafe, jumping off the rocks at ricks cafe. The chin's doing good. <laughs> it rains mainly in the plains in Spain. That's um, right. And so um, we ended up in Miami Beach, which is all in all in my books. What? And, and, you went uh, from that to Miami Beach? You're we prime. You we must have well, fucking we, fucked out when you went to Miami Beach. We spent all our money, so we couldn't go uh, going south. So my friend said, I know these people in Miami. And so we went there and we stayed with them for a bit. And uh, um, it's all in the book. It's all in the book. I don't want to give it away. No, no, so, no, no. Okay, so that's a that's a good little teaser. Are you going to do an audio book? We talked a little bit about. Are you, can you do an audio book? Will you do one? Yeah, I'd love to do one. It, I, I've been looking into it. It's, it seems quite complicated. I don't know. So if anyone's got any ideas, um, I got. Yeah, I, have, I have an idea. You do do an audio book. Yeah, you you 
narrate your you read your book and you yeah no i would but yeah but the, there are certain regulations and rules and all this like you know i, I was i couldn't figure i'm well, you know me i'm terrible with all this so no no it wasn't Next it's topic. super okay reach out if anybody out there wants to help them with the audio book but it, i think if you just record yeah. your voice hmm. i think yeah. and reading the book that's the that is an audio book but there are certain companies that get it out there and they have certain restrictions and rules and regulations and so i don't know but anyway so anyway i take a greyhound bus or trailways and i end up in north carolina and chapel hill visiting people that i've met in jamaica and my friend there was working uh, as a carpenter on uh, on a film, it was a PBS film, and so I joined the construction crew for six weeks, and it was uh, we shot in an old mill town, you know, so it was like deliverance, you know. There actually was a kid with a, a banjo, and I had a pet pig, and there was just one family left in this uh, old town. It was called Glencoe <coughs> in North Carolina, and so I got on the, on the crew. And uh, the rest is history. I, and then I ended up in, in New York and working as a second grip. And then I switched to being electric because I wanted, being a photographer anyway, I wanted to learn lighting. So and then I got worked as a best boy, you know, which is a second electric. And those are the guys who run the cables and, and everything, look after the electricity, the generators and everything. And then you progress to a gaffer and then I uh, ended up shooting uh, low budget films in New York and uh, yeah worked with uh, with a lot of good people and what, was your, came out. what was your favorite uh, project um, uh, film wise oh boy that I filmed um, I think a job I did in India actually I did a film in India in Bollywood in uh, 2004 it was called my far away bride <laughs> and um I forgot the guy's name now but the guy that was in um um sex in the city J jason lewis he was in it so all the girls knew him in in india they were all swarming you know swooning over, over him kind of thing so um it was a lot of film about east meets west a romantic tale you know it was it was pretty good but i enjoyed what i did in it and filming in india is you know uh, crazy it's a, it's a blast Let's, i mean it's, um can you give us sort of the cliff notes like the difference between shooting a film in bollywood and shooting a film in hollywood um well it's it's organized chaos in india uh, um whereas hollywood's just chaos otherwise yeah well that's true um otherwise the same it's the same deal, really. And they probably have a lot more crew members because they're cheaper. You know, I mean, you can get a crew person for a bowl of rice or something. So uh, somebody told me a story about when they were shooting Gandhi that it was cheaper to have an Indian guy hold a, uh, a light stand and it was put a sandbag on, on the light. So <laughs> they would employ these guys, you know, to just stand there and hold the light. But, uh, and then they would set a light sometimes and it'd be on a, on a rope, you know, and then it would swing this way and then you'd have to grab the actor and put them under the, the light instead of the other way around. <laughs> and, well, who are uh, some of your favorite uh, cinematographers? Who are my favorite cinematographers? Wow. Well, it's got to be uh, Vittorio Storaro, I suppose. Um, 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 the guy who did the godfather was in that gordon willis um you know roger deakins pretty good isn't he I've got the oscar but i like the old school i like the old film noir guys uh, i like the guy who did the austin awesome wells films so um, got his name now but all that film noir stuff i thought all that stuff was excellent did you see mink sorry did you see mink I did, yeah. Well, exactly that kind of style, but the film itself, get a bit. <clears throat> tell me, tell me, though, the, the, is it not, I haven't seen it. Have you seen it? Oh, I just I mean, saw like, it. Was a total bore. Yeah. And I mean, Gary Oldman's always good no matter what he does, but this guy who was, I mean, he had no perso personality or it was just strange. I don't know. I have to see it again. Maybe I'd like it better the second time. Is right? it just all style, no substance? um 
Yeah, there's not a lot of substance to it. I don't know what this guy's story was. Um, I got to see it again. Um, <clears throat> it's a. Uh, it just wasn't very interesting to me, or even that entertainment value wasn't there. But it wasn't artsy enough to get you into that genre either, you know. So I don't know. You got you got to see. It's kind of. I heard it's a little disjointed. It's a little. It's a little kind of clunky. Yeah, clunky. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just didn't find it. I didn't find this, this character. I can't really remember what he did, actually, now. Have you, what are the patterns that you've seen in the industry, like, genre-wise, and where it might be going in the next five to ten years? But things are moving, actually, at a, yeah, five, ten-year rate. I have my ideas, but I wanted to get yeah, your... Yeah, that's hard to say, isn't it, really? I mean, it seems like um, it, it's all cyclical, isn't it? I mean, Westerns will probably come back again for a while. Um, I hope the 60s, because I got my 60s script, which I wanted the Kinks to be a part of, the Kinks music, because it's about growing up in London in the 60s, and includes the mods and the rockers and all that, and, you know, the music scene and just, you know, the naughty English schoolboy thing. I mean, it's very uh, <laughs> very sort of naive. And uh, well, I, I, I wrote, I read it the other day. I wrote it in 76 and I, uh, I almost got it done with Lorimar films years ago when they were around. But the financing fell through and everything. And I was only like 25 then. And uh, it was kind of the first scripts I wrote. And, and I got these people interested. And I thought, wow, this is easy. You know, welcome to, uh, you know, America. It is the land of, uh, you know, streets are paved with gold. And yeah, but uh, <laughs> you know the story. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, this, uh, I don't know what this generation is called now, X millenniums. I, I don't know what. what X millennium. X millennium. That's, that's the next group. <laughs> um, but they tend to, you know, I mean, still the sixties, seventies music is still. They, they, I mean, it's, that's always going to be there. I mean, it's so substantial. You know, there's such a, it's so solid. I think that music, as opposed to you know a lot of music now, it's just a lot of screaming and. The lyrics, I mean, you look at the Beatles lyrics and I mean, the Beatles were amazing when you think about it. I mean, they set the, they set the path for a, a lot of people, I think. <clears throat> so, so that 60s, 70s movement, you know, is all, did you ever see Quadrophenia? You know, I, I was a little too young then, but that was the age where the mods were popping pills, you know, black beauties, purple hearts and everything. And, well, you yeah, know, that's, those are, those, are those uppers, downers and... Ruby reds or your sunshine oh, yellows? Yeah. Oh God, I don't know if they're ups or downs or what. <laughs> That's too long ago. I never was in, into the pills thing. But, no, I don't uh, be, I don't, I'm not a pill guy. Yeah. Ever yeah. do mushrooms? Wanna, uh, sorry? Have you ever done mushrooms? Oh yeah, I like mushrooms, yeah. They're fun. When's the last time you did mushrooms? I can't tell you. Okay, are you on mushrooms well, right now? <laughs> right, before this, right before this interview, right? <laughs> No, probably a couple of years ago. Well, oh, more than that, two or three, three years ago, maybe. Yeah, they're fun. Yeah, but, yeah you gotta uh, take them in the right context. I want to make yeah. it start making a segment. I'm gonna get somebody to do a segment on, uh, like a mushroom moment, so or a mushroom fact, and just interject them because I think people should, you know, in the right context, it could be really good. I actually was on somebody's podcast on mushrooms the other day, Kyle Dunningham, All right. at Homeless Sliced Alone. I did a live, I got into this after party. I love you, Kyle, and as Sly Sloan, at home with Sly Sloan. Anyways, check out that out. There's a, I love those guys. And I got on there, I was on Mushrooms and Tripping Hardcore. We went live. And that was a trip. I'd like I to could, see it. Well, yeah, I was, I was uh, yeah. Anyways, yeah. but yeah, Mushrooms yeah. in the right context can be very, very nice and very, actually very, you know, you can bring what you think out of, you know, the experience. You don't forget about it like it like other things but like you can bring that experience back into this reality oh yeah absolutely and you, and you can control mushrooms really because you just take, have a little nibble you wait 20 minutes and you can kind of control it it's not like a you know what the lsd would trips were like you know where you don't know where you're going and you're just <laughs> <laughs> what was the lsd uh, like in the uh, did you do it in the 60s or the 70s uh, no, I didn't do it in the 60s. Um, I think the first time I did it was in New York. Actually, it was in New York, and it's in my book. 
and it was um it was the bicentennial celebrations and i just got to new york so this was uh i got to new york i think in may because uh, I, I went back to england and then went back to new york and i married this girl that i met on a, on a film and um so the bicentennial was you know july 4th 17 uh, 1976 and so there was a whole party of them, maybe a dozen of us all took some blood or acid, you know, and we went on the West Side Highway that was there and was all the liquid? fireworks. Sorry? It was liquid? It was liquid. liquid? No, no, it was uh, like a blotter, blood or acid. Oh, a little piece of paper. Yeah, with a little Mickey Mouse on it. <clears throat> so we all did that and it was a, it was a fantastic experience because uh, the fireworks were amazing and then... I bet. I looked up and then all the fireworks were going off behind the Statue of Liberty. And then this big firework went up and exploded and it twinkled down. It was about 200 feet high and it just twinkled down into the, in the stars and stripes, the whole pattern of the stars and stripes that were out of fire. I mean, it was an unbelievable show, one of the best. <laughs> I'm still recovering. So that was, you know, we were all uh, tripping on that one. That was fun. But it was a great day because all the tall boats, had sailed in from all over the world. So New York Harbor had all these tall ships, you know, tall ships, I mean, not tall boats. And um, yeah, there were loft parties all afternoon. It seemed like everybody was high on something. And Sounds like a Grateful were... Dead concert. Yeah, I guess I've never been to a Grateful Dead concert. Yeah. They're the best. Those are the... Yeah, yeah I heard. Yeah. My, my best memories in my life are from uh, the two that I went to. Uh, very, uh, very existential experiences, very, very metaphor, oh, yeah. very visual, very uh, yeah. interdimensional, life affirming, all that. All uh, that. Uh, great, very like. Yeah. <clears throat> well, now they're using them uh, as um, um, psychological drugs now, aren't they? Um, psycho, what do you call it? Psycho. Um... Active. Psycho something or other. Psychoactive? They're using them. They're using them for certain um, psychological PTSD and stuff like that for oh, better reasons. Uh, yeah, it's very useful. Yeah, I think mushrooms would help with all that. Yeah. I don't know about acid because it's a little too. No, I mean, I, yeah, we I kind of blurred yeah. the line into from acid to that. Yeah. But um, yeah, mushrooms uh, microdosing is very very much like common now. What about ayahuasca? Did you do ever ever do ayahuasca? Yeah. <clears throat> did you do that? I did ayahuasca in the Amazon jungle. You did? Wow. The shaman, the real deal. That I was the a, whole thing. Yeah. I did it in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. With the shaman and uh, yeah. what was the well, situation he he, like? He said he was a shaman. <laughs> was that a shaman Charlie? <laughs> yeah. Shaman, shaman Fred. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a shaman right now. I'm a shaman. I'm your shaman right now. Uh, what was this? Can you, uh, unless it's in the book, can you give us a quick uh, uh, story about that experience? Well, it was just a shaman that I heard about. It was um, up in the mountains in, in Jalisco State in Mexico. <clears throat> Somebody told me about this guy, and uh, there was only a handful of people that, that went. And, um, you know, you prepare yourself for it, as you know, for the week. You don't have coffee or anything. You don't eat or very little. And, and don't um, eat any White Castle or anything. Like don't that. eat a White Castle, especially the, before that. Not, the, not the square ones, because they get stuck in your throat. Oh, good. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, yeah, it was, a, it was an experience. I think I saw my ancestors and all the blood and guts of history. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I mean, some people say it totally changes their life forever. I don't know about that, but um, it depends. Everyone has a different experience, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a harsh, uh, it's a harsh thing to go through. I mean, you know, you throw up and everything like peyote, I suppose. But. Yeah. Well, did you? Uh, you sweat, you puke, you piss, you shit, you do all yeah, the stuff. All of that. Yeah. And, but it's a, it's like a, it's like a an astringent. It's like yeah. it's like detox. It's a major detox for sure. Yeah, it's everything you do in a day, except it all happens in in, in a minute. <laughs> a minute over the course of eight hours. How long did your trip last? It was about that, about eight hours, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But it seems like uh, you know time is irrelevant during that time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What'd you think about the taste? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. 
Well, how would you describe it? Oh, I don't think I can. Just very bitter. And, uh, it tastes sure like that... it tastes mm -hmm. like liquid wood. Yeah, well, there is a lot of wood in it, isn't it? Because it's, it's a plant thing. But I'm certainly no expert on it to talk about it, and I don't want to be known as a, a drug guy. Because no, well, those are experiences. You're not. They are experiences. You yeah. smoke weed now, though. Yeah, I smoke. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Um, and you know we got about ten minutes left. Okay. And you know I'm not gonna get out of here. So you get everything you, out of me. Until you uh, tell us. <laughs> And I'll never ask you to tell the story again. Can you tell us the Robert Duvall story? Oh, no, I can't. It's too upsetting. No, I basically... Come on. I, I basically... It's a cautionary him. tale. It's good uh, that people know this. No, it's not. It's upsetting. No, no, it, but it's... It, not many people can tell a story like this. All right, well... Uh, <clears throat> I did a film with Robert Duvall in 1980, and I was the gaffer on it. It was called Angelo my love and it was about a couple of gypsy kids that uh, Duval would come across in the streets because they were always trying to sell things uh, uh, there were two brothers Angelo and Michael and Angelo I think was about eight or ten at the time and his brother was a little older so anyway Duval decided to do this uh, drama documentary on these gypsy kids and gypsy life within New York because you know there's a in the village there's a a tarot card place every couple of blocks, you know, that you don't really notice. I didn't really notice until I started working on the film. So they have these tarot card places and everything. And then, uh, so we went to, uh, we filmed, you know, it was for real. We, we filmed these, uh, the Russian gypsies and the Greek gypsies. And the story was all set around a ring that was stolen. It was like a gypsy folklore story that Duval integrated into, you know, modern times. So anyway, cut a long story short, it was it was kind of interesting. I, I don't know if you can find it. It, was, it might be on YouTube. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I mean, I got to know, I got to know Bob, and um, you know, we, we went out quite a few times, and he took me to the screening of uh, the uh, Coppola film. What was it? The one, one from the heart. I think. Oh, anyway, I love that movie. Yeah, so we were kind of. Yeah, so you know, it was uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. And then he left a message on my answering machine one day saying, you know, he wanted to wanted me to grab a camera and go down south and film these TV evangelists that he, uh, you know, just some research thing. And uh, I don't know, I never returned his phone call. So I mean, to this day, it kills me. So I kind of gave my career away to somebody else, and then. Uh, you know, yeah, the, the footage, the research footage was for his film, The Apostle, you know, that I think he got an Academy Award for. So anyway, that's my big uh, fuck up in life, was that career-wise. And then there are other, you know, screw Other ones to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still here and uh, battling away. So, yeah, I mean, it's, as my mum used to say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. That's where you have you never ever spoken to him ever since then? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah, a couple of times. No, he's 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 you know very nice towards me, considering you know because I kind of blew him off, which was so stupid. Plus, you know, he's a great guy, and uh, you know, he was a he was a nice friend to me. So that's not good. Maybe we should edit that, cut it out, because that's kind of an embarrassment, and I'm not. Really no, I think you know. I think it's it's actually you know. If I didn't, if I didn't think it was important, I wouldn't have asked. But I think as we go, a lot of people have experiences in the industry oh, that yeah. are shoulda, coulda, wouldas, like, yeah. like, you know, me meeting Robert Downey Jr. and not, it was a moment, but I didn't have, I gave him a car, I was putting a yappy hour thing together and he's an art collector. Robert, if you're out there, please, you know, gotta make, I, he's got this other movie coming out. I don't know what kind of. Anyways, he, but we had a, he collects art and I had a bunch of art just right around the corner and he is, he is nice to say, Hey Robert, and he's with a friend that looked like one of the freak brothers, fabulous very freak brothers. And we all talked for about five minutes and uh, he, I told him I was a filmmaker and an artist and um, he's all, oh, I'd love to see your stuff. And I gave him a card to my yappy hour that I was putting on, on, on Abikini. And I almost went after him to write, tell him, you know, I asked him if he had a dog. He goes, no, this is right before he did Iron Man 2. And, um, 
and but there's a moment in time where we were just, I guess we were more connecting as people, but um and but I wish it would have given my number. I almost ran after back after him yeah. and said, Hey, hold on, that's that doesn't have my number on it. But um anyways, it's like little moments like that and running yeah. into Zach Galifianakis and not really doing too much, you know. But I think it's also just the moment in time. But I don't think it's uh you know, I, I guess it's we're being genuine in those moments as well. But like, so it makes me, oh. you know, oh, no. that story that you told me, yeah. I identify on certain different levels and I'm sure other oh. people do as well. I think I remember what, what went through my mind at the time. I thought, do I really want to go down South and film these, you know, TV right-wing crazy TV evangelists, but you know, it, it was a job and to turn down a job in any shape or form is kind of crazy, <laughs> especially with, you know, Duval and, uh, was this before or after the peyote trip or the, the ayahuasca trip? Was this before or after that? Way before, way, way, way before. Yeah, this was 1980. And, uh, <laughs> but he never did the apostle till like 97 or 98, I think. So, you know, that was a long time span. It took him a long time to do it. I mean, so there you go. They're talking about how long it takes to get a film going. I mean, this is Robert Duval. I think he may have used his own money in the end to do the apostle. Yeah, he did. But um, so there you go. So, you know, this was 83 to 90. So like 15 years you're talking about. In the meantime, of course, he was working, obviously. But um, you have to answer the call to adventure, as Joseph Campbell said. Ah. See, and I refuse the call to adventure because it's kind of like the Tao, you know. You get, I mean, the stuff that happened to me from India on and going to Jamaica, and then I end up in North Carolina, I end up in the film business, then I go to New York, and then... It's the flow, you know, it's the Tao, it's the flowing river. And I just went, put up a dam and that was it. <clears throat> Been playing for it ever since. But, you know, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> life's good, life's good. you got to say life's good, right? Hey, you're in an apartment in Santa Monica. You have the sun on you. You have a wall of art that you created behind you. Uh, you're uh, Obviously, we're going to do a movie at some point and shoot it on film. What's your um? What's the trick with shooting on film? What's the trick of shooting on film? Yeah, what's the the biggest do's well, and do nots? As opposed to digital, you mean, or just in general? Just I think well, you could take it either or. Well, exposure, obviously, with film. I mean, film. You know, you know, the Ari uh, Alexa has something like thirteen stop latitude. You know. And, film, negative film back in those days, I don't know, five or six, maybe seven, I don't know if you pushed it. Um, so the thing that, well, you know, you don't know what you've got until you get the rushes back. So there's always this little feeling in the uh, end of the night, especially if you're doing night exteriors, for instance, and you're underexposing by two, three stops, etc. cetera. And, uh, um, so, you know, digital has taken all that anxiety, not that I ever had that much because I was always pretty confident, but I liked the fact that you had an exposure meter and it was more mystical. Being a DP was a lot more magical and mystical. Nobody, nobody really knew exactly what you did. And, you know, you, I mean, I shot films without a monitor, you know, and half, you know, back in the day and director would say, do you get the shot? And you say, yeah, I got the shot. Or maybe I think the, the grip walked in the back. Can I even have another one, you know? And so it was, uh, it was kind of more trusting people, I suppose. And then there wasn't this incredible waste of, you know, take after take after take because, you know, the producers would say, we got 3,000 feet left to film for the rest of the day. Well, they'd tell the director that. So, you know, it was... Uh, I don't know if precise is the word, but maybe it was a bit more precise or you really know how to, as a director, um, not so much as DP because you just did what the directors want you to do. But, um, you know, now, I mean, these these editors get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of, you know, digital dots or whatever it is now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've not worked in the business for a few years, so, and I, you know, I do miss it. What I miss is the camaraderie, really, and the traveling. I mean, I've, I've shot in, you know, India and Brazil and Madrid, Luxembourg, Mexico, India, and that's that's the great part about it. And, you know, these weren't big films. They were 
you know, all independent films, but you still get to go to these places and you, you meet with, you know, your, your crews are from all over the world. So the film crews are basically all a bunch of gypsies, you know, and they're the same kind of people. So that's your tribe, you know, and it's, uh, yeah. So the thought of me ever getting a regular job, I couldn't imagine, you know. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Have you thought about doing a short film or creating a, a short film project? Maybe something like a little glimpse of what you want to, you know, your movie or at all, or, you know, just doing it. I know yeah. it's, it's a period piece, so it's more expensive, but can, you can, you can maybe uh, like, a, you know, like a three minute short or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I quite often, uh, well, more, more so in the winter at Santa Monica when it gets a little misty on the beach, I keep thinking, you know, like a, uh, Francois Truffaut film uh, or something, all in black and white, you know, a nice love story, a couple walking down the beach and it's all misty and there's nobody around. And yeah, but I can't come up with the, <laughs> the story. But I did write something years ago called The uh, the Landlord and it's kind of a just a spooky sort of horror film. It's only about 20 minutes long. Uh, and, uh, well, maybe we could talk about that, but it's not yeah. easy to get it all together. I'm terrible at getting things together. I'm I'm good. You know, I can turn up and do it, but uh, I'm yeah, not a producer. You know, I don't have a producer's mind. Um, yeah, it's like uh, we're gonna wrap it up here. We're gonna take off out of here in about two minutes. All right. Um, but yeah, getting. I think. I think. Uh, I was thinking about what they used to do is uh, back in the day is they spend more time on the shot. Right now we're because uh, like oh they set up the shop because there's only have so many thousands of feet left of film so that's what you're gonna shoot with, um so they would those shots are really really fucking thought out whereas opposed to today uh, with a lot of people uh, there's so much content it's um they'll, they'll you can run around with a camera and stabilize it and post yeah and I mean, also do all these you can recompose the shots now. And digitally, you know, if you're shooting clean, you know, if it's a high enough, you know, it's so that it's changed. It's, it's, it, I think more of the, what you did in on set is done more in post now. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, now it's a bunch of snapshots and then you give it to the, the editor, especially, you know, that's the way of TV. One of my pet peeves is <clears throat> unnecessary camera movement. You know, that people are at a table and the camera's spinning around and around and you know, oh, oh my God. God. Yeah, now let's concentrate on the acting. I mean, the, the camera's a tool to tell the story. It's not about the camera. The camera tells the story. <clears throat> and um, I mean, I just saw Lawrence of Arabia again recently for the hundredth time because it was on YouTube, you know, and I thought I'd take a look. And the camera just sits there and everything happens, you know, inside the frame. I mean, that very famous shot of uh, Omar Sharif when he's in the uh, way in the distance and he's coming through that mirage mm. and he shoots the guy. I mean, just nobody would sit through that now. They have attention deficit <laughs> disorder, you know. <laughs> but, and it's like old, the old filmmaking is a lot like that too. But uh, yeah, I think times changed and, you know, I certainly think, you know, the digital, you know, it's obviously here to stay. This is, I mean, I don't know. I think um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was shot in film. Robert um, Richardson. Yeah. Yeah. It, it Robert, it, Quentin Tarantino would be nothing without Robert Richardson. Yeah, probably not. No, yeah. dude. He took him, took him from Oliver Stone, shot yeah. JFK, shot U-Turn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, he's, he's, he's up there, isn't he? Yeah. Doors. Yeah. 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 I was on the set of The Doors with Oliver Stone and Robert Richardson at one point. I told you that story, right? Uh, yeah, 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 I think you did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that yeah. was incredible. Yeah. I don't know why I was hanging out with them, but they were they were setting up a shot in um, a field of hippies uh, during the night. It was early in the morning or something, and their ILM came in, and because um, uh, they were going to project the, the people were going to morph into an Indian's face, like an old like, a, like one of the Indian guys that was in the film. There, it was going to morph into that. It was a great shot. I just, I, it was just fun to hang out. And uh, I guess they maybe thought that I worked there, but anyways, that was a moment in time. But, um, yeah. uh, but hey, you know what? I think we used up that hour pretty good. Yeah, it's amazing what a gin and orange will do. Yeah, um, I love it. I need one of those. I've got to promote my books here. It's my poetry Yeah, yeah. Book. Uh, promote your books. Let people know how you can get back 
uh, or they get a hold of you, find you. Well, let me tell you what they are. And go. They're on, uh, they're on Amazon. And the first book I wrote was called The Laughing Man, which is this one. And that's about growing up in England in, uh, you know, I was born in 51. So I was like six years after the first, first World War, the Second World War. And um, so that's about growing up in England, school days and everything. It's called The Laughing Man. It, it trips to India, Jamaica and everything. It's a, a memoir, the first memoir. The Laughing Man, it's on Amazon. I got this one, Poems from a Stranger, which I always feel like a stranger, especially in America. And so that's uh, that's on Amazon, Poems from a Stranger. And the last one is Stories from the Big Apple and Beyond, which is about the film business in New York and also about traveling and adventures in India and so on. And it ends on 9-11. I happen to have been there on the street when 9-11 happened. Uh, I was there on a job and obviously it got cancelled, but I, I was there 20 blocks away and I saw the whole thing go down. So I thought it was a good place to end the book. So that story is from the Big Apple on Amazon. So, uh, and I make like $3 if you buy my book. So, you know, getting there, getting there. <laughs> well, you didn't do it for the money, that's for sure. I didn't do it for the money, no. Yeah, no, it's funny. I always wrote when I was traveling and I would, you know, I'd, Till one day I found I got I had a box like this of scribbles everywhere from here and there. So the book was kind of well, the, the both the books were sort of written, and I just had to join up the, the dots, you know, kind of thing. And always taking photographs when I traveled, I could remember where I was, and you know, it's so it's, a lot of the stories are quite quite more specific because I was I wrote them at the time, you know. So yeah. anyway, that's it. That's my promotion. How do people find you? Are you on Facebook or Instagram? Well, I'm on Facebook, yeah, under my name, John Drake. And then I have a page, and I'm actually trying to set up something now with a guy who's doing it all for me in North Carolina. So I never really promoted the books. Um, but now I'm trying to because I thought, well, why not? You know, you never know. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple. Um, I'm going to get to them at some point. I'm not a big reader. I've only read like yeah. one or two books in my entire life. But I will at some point, or we'll just make a movie. I know a lot. Or I'll just keep on getting I know about bars, and we'll just—I'll just hear them in person. Yeah, I, yeah. Get the, I, get the, I get the I get the audio book before the audio book. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what are you gonna do the rest of your day? Well, that's a very good question. Isn't it? Not a lot. The last question of the day. And Not then we're out of here. Well, I promise. I'm, I'm always trying to think of things to do, and I have a million thoughts run through my head. You know, like we all do. And, uh, you know, if I get really bonkers, I'll paint. Or, uh, you know, I'm always walking around Santa Monica. I got the beach two blocks away. Friends come down, go, go out. But um, I do miss working, I must admit, and getting paid for it. That's another good thing. You know, I, I worked as a director cameraman for 12 years, and <clears throat> that was very lucrative. But uh, it was very competitive also. So I didn't work a lot, but when you worked, you, you made a good bunch of money that's when i lived in laguna which is uh, a lovely place to live and yeah yeah but um well yeah so a varied career yes a varied career uh we'll do a part two at some point but uh next time i see you uh we'll have some beer and and talk the talk and yes. but hey we got in the yeah. show John Drake, thank you so pleasure. much for thank being you. on thank you. Friends with Friends. Thank you, sir. And, um, and uh, <laughs> let's talk soon, all right? Yeah, we'll do. All right, mate. All right. Thanks, Brad. It was fun. Thank you. That was fun. See, that was easy. It was. It was easy, wasn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That, okay. Well, that was just the warm-up bit now. Now we're going to start now, right? <laughs> I'll just... Exactly. Peace and love and all that. Peace and love. Peace and love. All right. Friends with Friends.